Okay, good. All right, uh, I'm Alexi. I'm really excited to be here. And I'll be talking to you about how you can reason about foreign function interfaces without modeling the foreign language. This is work I did as part of my master's at the University of Waterloo with Gregor Richards and Eleanor Teca. So imagine that you are a typed Lua programmer, and you're working on the simple web server. You like typed Lua because typed Lua has meta theory. Somebody developed a formal specification for the language and proved things about the language that are in principle true for all programs written in typed Lua. In principle. Imagine now that you want to integrate some foreign code into your server, say a font library written in C. Unfortunately for you, you lose all of the meta theory that you had, unless, of course, that meta theory was developed on a formal specification which included the FFI and thus included a full model of the foreign language. And when that language is C, you can kind of imagine why these sort of formalizations are quite rare. So what if you could do better? Well, what if you could model an FFI and reason about one without fully modeling the foreign language? And what kind of meta theory would you get in a situation like that? So if you're at all interested in this, you're at the right place. And that's the subject of my talk, formalizing FFIs without modeling the foreign language. So uh, for a quick layout of my talk, um, first, I'm going to give an intuition of the semantics of programs where you don't know what the foreign language is doing. Um, for this, I'll be using an idealized host language with C as a guest language. Now, in our paper, we worked with typed Lua as a host and C as a guest. But in principle, um, the techniques described here apply more broadly to other FFIs. After giving some intuition, I'll be walking through some of the key operational semantics that we developed, which sort of underpin our contribution and drive our semantics, before ending with a brief discussion of the meta theory that you get um, in such a formal specification. So before diving into some math, um, let's get on the same page about what I mean by FFI. So um, some allowed use of the foreign language in some of the code that you'll see throughout this talk is, of course, it is a foreign function interface. We should be able to call foreign functions. So this is the syntax for that. But FFIs aren't only about calling foreign functions. They're also about using foreign data. So we are allowing the host language to hold pointers directly to guest language data. Now, there is a caveat here, and that is our formalization is assuming some level of memory separation between the host and guest languages. So what that means here is that our host language is holding a pointer, which is pointing into the guest language heap where the guest data resides. We allow the host language to directly allocate guest language data without sort of dipping into arbitrary guest language code using this uh, CLOC um, syntax. And finally, we allow the host language to read and write through these guest language pointers. So our goal is to reason about programs um, like this, programs that are calling foreign code without actually knowing what the foreign code is doing. So here, um, we, are, we have CF, which is a pointer to some C font. And we're calling a foreign function, C font fun, with CF. And we want to reason about this program. But we don't know what C font fun is doing. We don't, we don't want to model the, the foreign language code. But from the perspective of the host language, there's a certain level of things, a certain amount of things that are sort of interesting. So the host language might be concerned if this foreign function call crashes. Maybe the call has some sort of segmentation fault um, during execution. Or this foreign call could succeed and say, if it was supposed to return an integer, return some integer to us. So even without modeling the foreign language sort of fully, we still know kind of what the foreign language is sort of doing. Um, and this is, this is a, going to be a source of non-determinism. In our semantics, foreign function calls will be non-deterministic. But that's not the whole story. Even a successful foreign function call could possibly modify foreign data that we're holding in the host language. Because remember, the foreign data is residing in, C's data is residing in C's heap. And this C function call could have uh, either um, fatally modified those memory cells, perhaps by freeing them, which would cause this access to cause a segmentation fault in our host language, which is not good. Uh, but it's also possible that the foreign call just 
modified it, or didn't even touch it. So this means that even accessing foreign data will be non-deterministic. But only sometimes. If this particular access succeeds, a subsequent access will also succeed and do so deterministically. It will give us the same result that the previous one did, assuming that we didn't have a foreign call between. So these are the sort of ideas that we're going to be trying to capture in our operational semantics. So um, before jumping into the semantics themselves, I'm going to kind of go over some of the key ingredients uh, that you'll see come up frequently throughout this talk. So first, as we saw on the last slide, black, uh, foreign function calls are really black boxes. We don't know what the foreign code is doing in our formalization. So those calls are going to be non-deterministic. Indeed, using our pointers to foreign data, we also need to account for the fact that these calls, these foreign function calls might have modified that data. So to capture that, we'll be using the concept of taint, which might be familiar to some of you. And uh, we'll see exactly what we mean by that on the next slide. But taint will be useful for uh, capturing non-determinism for data access. Finally, in order to allow the host language to guarantee its own correct use of the FFI, we will give it um, knowledge of guest language types. And we do this by plugging in the type system of the guest language into that of the host language. So I mentioned taint. And this is actually a good opportunity to go over our model of the heap as well. So here, uh, this is the same code snippet sort of as we had before. Uh, we have CF uh, pointer to some C font. Um, and what that looks like in our model of the heap is it looks a little bit like this. In our heap, we have labels for all of the members of, so for instance, this is, could be a struct. A uh, font might have a size and an identifier. And the heap contents are going to be triples in our formalization. We have the value that's actually in the heap cell. We have the expected type of that heap cell. And we'll be using this to handshake with access um, later in the semantics. Finally, we're going to have a list of taint. So what this means is this is going to be a list of all of the foreign functions which may have tampered with this memory cell. Speaking of foreign functions, let's see what happens if we make a C call. Now, this beta that you see here is just a unique identifier for the call. So you could think of this possibly as a line of code. This call might modify all of C's heap. So the way that we're going to capture this is we will use taint. We will have this call taint the heap. What that means is the call will insert um, its taint identifier into the taint segment of these, uh, of these memory cells. And the purpose of this taint is to indicate to some future access to a foreign language um, object that the access should be non-deterministic. So here in the heap, cf.size is tainted, which means that this access will be non-deterministic. Assuming that the access succeeds, though, we will erase the taint from the heap, which means that the next access will be deterministic and will give us the same thing that the previous access did. So now, I'm going to go into the actual operational semantics and how we um, capture this more formally. Um, but before that, it's useful to look at the shape of the judgment that we're going to be working with. So the way I want you to read this is that we have some expression E in a C heap sigma C, which is stepping to a new expression E prime in an updated C heap sigma C prime. Let's begin with uh, C calls. So in our, um, in our formalization, a C call looks a little bit like this. Well, exactly like this, actually. Um, we're, we have the C call term, which is calling a C function. Now, we don't have a function body, so to make up for that, the function has a notion of its argument type and its return type. You'll see why this is important in a moment. Here, we're calling this function with an argument, call it A. 
I'm going to taint identifier beta. So this is the unique ID associated with this call. Now, here at the top of the slide, I have um, a picture of the heap, if that's useful. So we have, again, labels and these triples. Uh, but I want to focus on the bottom right now and on this reduction. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ensure that the argument is a value. So we have a call by value semantics. Now, this is the stage where, if we had a normal, a regular semantics, we would substitute the argument in to the function body. But we don't have a function body. So all we can say is that, assuming now that we're modeling a successful call, this call is going to successfully return something of type T2. Of course, the call might have modified the, um, the heap. So we will also taint the C heap with the taint identifier associated with the call. So for L0, we actually inserted taint. We just put some taint. In L1, there was already a taint identifier there. Um, so we're just keeping track of all of the functions um, that could have modified these uh, heap cells. And of course, we will return the value that we will return the something of type T2. Of course, a C call can fail. And the rule for that is much simpler. So again, we check to see if A is a value. Again, this is the stage where we would actually perform the call. And here, we're modeling an unsuccessful call. So this should return an error. So we'll immediately have this step two, an error expression with taint, uh, specifying taint ID beta. Here, what this means is that we're in an error state because of whatever beta is referring to. And in this case, beta is simply referring to this call that just occurred. So this call is what crashed our program. I want to point out that these two rules are an example of the non-determinism in our semantics. Here, the only thing that we need to take this reduction is that A is a value. So, and remember that in the successful C call, A had to be a value as well, in addition to some other things. So any time that we could take a successful C call reduction, we can also take this unsuccessful C call reduction. This is an example, as I said, of non-determinism. Now let's turn our attention to accessing locations, specifically tainted locations in the C heap. What that looks like is it looks like a C get where we're C getting L, which is some location in sigma C in the C heap. And we're expecting that location to be of type T. I will again have a model of the, or a small heap here. So we see that location L is this triple, um, which is indeed tainted. So in order to access L, we should probably look in the C heap. And here we find, of course, the triple that we have up there. And we see that there is taint in this triple. We are modeling successful access. So this is the stage where we would go into the heap and grab the thing that was there. But we don't know what's there. C might have changed the bits. It might have done something. But here we know that we can actually access it and successfully do so. So we will again just take, get something of the expected type and call that V. Then we will go into the C heap, replace the triple here with a new triple where we put in the thing that we just got and we remove all of the taint. This will make the subsequent access deterministic. And we see that up there. And finally, we will coerce whatever we got to the host language, and we will produce that as the result of this access. Similar story to unsuccessful C calls versus successful C calls. Unsuccessful access is a much more simple rule. We will again go into the heap at this location. We see that there is taint. This is the stage where we would go in and grab the thing that was there. But here we're trying to model that that does not succeed. So this is where we would have, for instance, a segmentation fault if C freed this memory cell. So as before, we step to the error state. But here, identifying beta. This beta is whatever taint was in the heap. So this means that the call or calls that may have modified this value, this heap cell, will be identified by this error expression. 
So it's not the CGET that's breaking or that's causing the crash. Really, the fault lies with the foreign call from earlier. Now, there is a, there, this is, of course, uh, non-deterministic, just like this, the case with C-call. We see that the precondition here is strictly more permissive than that of a successful access. So all we need here is that the location is tainted. Um, and when the location is tainted and you're trying to access it, you can really take either this reduction or the previous one, the one for the successful access. Now, these four rules are really the, the driving force of our semantics. They are, um, they sort of allow us to reason about what the foreign language is doing without having a full model of the language itself. We're sort of trying to deal with the effects that the language can have, the foreign language can have, on the overall system. So what kind of meta theory can you prove about a semantics like this, about the semantics of an FFI where we don't actually model the foreign language? Well, I want to start off by giving a, a sort of two themes um, that we found in our meta theory. The first one is that if you are in a state of determinism, you are in a state where you have sort of accounted for all of the things that the guest language might have done. And this means that any meta theory which was applicable to the host language should be applicable in this setting. Next, if you're in a state of non-determinism, so if you have taint in your heap, any non-deterministic failure that occurs, you want to be able to pin that on the guest language. You don't want these to be the fault of the host language. So there are two main results that, we, that I'm going to be showing you today, and that there are more, there's more in the paper. But first, um, we'll, we'll take a step back. This is more about typed Lua and C rather than the idealized language I have presented here. So for specifically typed Lua and C um, in the paper, we have that well-typed programs don't get stuck so long as the environment is taint-free. So as long as we're deterministic, when there's no taint, we are deterministic, we have the sort of type soundness you would expect from typed Lua. Now, this isn't to say that you can't use the guest language whatsoever. There's a number of things, like using the pointers and allocating, that don't introduce taint. But beyond that, you could, in theory, have made some C call, which would have tainted all the heap, and then successfully accessed all of the heap locations, removing all of the taint, and thus reclaim determinism and reclaim type soundness. Now, this is a sort of a fundamental result, but it's not surprising. This is more of a sanity check. This is saying that our foreign um, interface semantics are OK. We have one more. Um, the other thing that we showed is that if a well-typed program does get stuck, we can always blame C. Uh, this is sort of unsurprising again. Um, but we know that we don't get stuck if there's no taint in the heap. And C is a singular source of taint. So this is a little bit, this just kind of falls out of the previous proof. So uh, if you're interested in more of the formal spec, um, specifically with respect to type blue and the CFFI, I recommend you check out the paper. Uh, we have a more thorough discussion of the meta theory there as well. And if you're interested, we have a, um, our artifact. We have the proof and the semantics mechanized in COC. Um, so I can point you to that if you hit me up. But uh, thank you, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you. OK. Uh, what's the first question? Thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering how this might work with multi-threading, where the C code could take memory at some undetermined time. So, um, so there are um, a number. There are some assumptions that we make about the C code, and the fact that there's no multi-threading is one such assumption. Um, if you're interested in the whole list, I'd recommend checking the paper. But we can talk about that a little bit more in depth offline if you want. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. Um, I was, yeah, you mentioned earlier about um, modeling the host lang uh, the guest language semantics in the host language. But um, how would you handle the case where the guest language semantics um, type system is far more powerful than what the host can model? Is what, sorry? It's more powerful than what the host can model. Is more powerful than what the host can model. Um, well, here we're really just, uh, the way that we integrated the type systems is we just took C's type system and plugged it into the type system of type Lua. So I think that um, you could 
still do this. It's just that I, I think you could still do it. I don't see why, why it would cause an issue. The, the, the type system for the guest language is, in a sense, self-contained. Um, and it doesn't really make reference to the host language, um, for what it's worth. Okay, yes. Yeah, one last question. Thanks for a very nice talk. Um, I was just thinking that uh, it feels like any static analysis that uh, wants to work with, uh, say, libraries, opaque libraries, has a version of this problem, right? Because you need to put some bound on what the other thing that you're not analyzing can do. Uh, but you don't know exactly what it is, but you, you want to sort of put some limits on it. So, so, so as my question is, do you have particular applications in mind for this? Have you thought about generalizing it to other scenarios? Anything of that flavor? Um, so are there any applications I have in mind of this? Uh, so um, really, the, the main thing that makes this interesting is that um, in regular uh, formal semantics, you just don't do this at all, because it's just too hard to model like all the constituent languages. So this would allow you to have sort of a lightweight model of, um, of like in, in a sense, any FFI that you want. Uh, though, as you mentioned, the sort of opaqueness problem where um, when you don't really know what the f library is doing, you can't say as much. Certainly here, you can't say as much as you could if you had a full model of the guest language. But our hypothesis is that um, that's not really something that people are really interested in. Well, I was just thinking, you might, it might even be the same language, but you don't have the source code, for example. Right, right, right. Um, but yeah, I guess that would be an interesting application. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.